fish. All right. Um, rather than spending a lot of time hearing me ramble, I'm going to just go ahead and introduce Andrea and Elliot, who are going to be talking to us about uh, IoT safety. So please give them a warm Schmookon welcome. for coming. We are in a tough time slot against two really great other talks, so thank you for choosing us. There's stickers at the front of the room for your yes. effort, um, which we will return to. Um, and so this talk we have titled, Be an IoT Safety Hero, Policing Unsafe IoT Through the Consumer Product Safety Commission. So we will tell you all about the Consumer Product Safety Commission, and first we start by telling you a little bit about us. So. Uh, Commissioner Kay is sitting commissioner uh, at the U.S. Consumer Product Safety Commission, the former chair, and I am a law professor uh, at Northeastern University, and I also co-direct the Center for Law, Innovation, and Creativity. Thank you. Is that better? Okay. Uh, so, first, a disclaimer. Commissioner Kay's views are his and not attributable to the rest of the commission at CPSC. My views are mine and uh, if you like them, you know, you should feel free to tell my employer that and, you know, think better of my colleagues for it if you, if you want. Uh, but if, you, if you'd like to read more of my views, there's the URL for my site and it has many long law review articles that few people have read but I would be thrilled to hear comments on them and uh, your thoughts on the issues that uh, are in them, I write on security. So, in case you decide you need a nap at some, at some point in this talk, here is the short version. And we hope to uh, zip through this and open it up to questions and discussion about IoT safety. So, first, we're going to breeze through 12 agencies or departments in about 15 minutes and talk about their role in security, IoT security in particular. Then, I will turn it over to Commissioner Kay, who will talk about new IoT guidance or guidelines. Is there a yeah, pr preference on term? Framework. framework. Uh, the new IoT framework that Commissioner Kay is releasing, and uh, he will talk to us a bit about the history of the Consumer Product Safety Commission, what it does, how it makes products uh, not hurt us and helps with enforcing against dangerous products. Uh, and then third, we will chat with you about how you too can be a uh, part of this exciting mission. Um, so as many of you know, junk hacking has turned into a uh, Sisyphean task where uh, there's no challenge in breaking IoT devices. So here's the challenge. The challenge is filing a complaint with the CPSC in a way that's reproducible to get some policy wheels in motion and to nudge uh, the level of safety up. So that's where we're going, and then we conclude with a friendly reminder of glorious stickers at the front of the room. So here we go, 12 agencies in 15 minutes or less and their role in security. First, many of you undoubtedly are familiar with the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission has a mission of protecting consumers, in particular against unfair and deceptive trade practices, and they are charged with stimulating a fair competitive environment uh, in terms of legitimate business activity. You may have heard of some of their security-based enforcement actions. They've, in fact, had over 60 data security enforcement actions. They also have released reports on the Internet of Things, and they've released a helpful Start with Security guide that has a bullet-pointed list of baselines for companies as they are starting to think about or hopefully have already thought about security in their operations and product manufacturing. So this is a great resource to direct your uh, friends who are not as security knowledgeable to get a sense of the baselines of security. Next, the Department of Justice, which is uh, well known in this community for its enforcement activities with respect to the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. DOJ has been engaging, uh, Maine Justice, has been engaging with the security research community and they have also released a set of guidelines for companies in terms of helping them to think about security intake and institute the kinds of processes that we see 
already represented in, for example, ISO standards like 29147 and 30111. Um, so DOJ has traditionally had a law enforcement mission seeking to uh, enforce criminal law, uh, and they are now also working with the security research community and trying to teach the benefits of strong security practices. Next, the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, some of you may know uh, Dr. Suzanne Schwartz, who comes to security conferences regularly. The FDA has both pre-market and post-market guidance on security in medical devices. There will be a conference at the end of this month with uh, respect to the new pre-market guidelines that the FDA is currently um, working through in, in draft form, and they will be final, I, I think, at that conference or shortly uh, thereafter. Um, and so the FDA is in charge of ensuring the efficacy, safety, efficacy, and security of human and veterinary products, uh, drugs, medical devices, and uh, the food supply, cosmetics, et cetera. Next, the Library of Congress and the Copyright Office. So some of you uh, are undoubtedly familiar with the Library of Congress. They have the beautiful building in DC with helpful librarians who can research anything for you. Um, but you may not know that the Copyright Office sits inside the Library of Congress. Um, some of you may be familiar with the Digital Millennium Copyright Act and Section 1201 of the DMCA in particular has an anti-circumvention provision. And this anti-circumvention provision until 2015 was a significant obstacle to security research. But in 2015, a group of computer scientists, including Matt Blaze in the other room, uh, and I acted as their counsel, we obtained a security research exemption to the DMCA Section 1201, and so the, the climate has substantially improved. So the, the Copyright Office and the Library of Congress are recognizing the importance of security research for making things safer even when copyright interests are in play. So they deserve to be commended for picking safety over uh, maximalist copyright enforcement. Next, the Department of Homeland Security, um, a very large uh, department um, that is charged with safeguarding the American people, our homeland, and our values. A piece of DHS is focused on cybersecurity, and that was recently cabined off into a more independently standing unit within DHS. Uh, DHS collaborates with other agencies and has all sorts of initiatives dealing with uh, information security and uh, national defense internally uh, uh, with respect to our systems. Um, so uh, DHS has been generally perceived as sort of the coordinating uh, department in terms of helping to spearhead improvements in uh, security infrastructure, um, including uh, most recently with the designation of voting machines as infrastructure that has uh, now fallen uh, potentially under some DHS uh, review. Next, the Securities and Exchange Commission, the mission of the SEC has generally been historically three parts. It is to protect investors, to facilitate capital formation in the markets for companies, and to promote market stability. So they police the stability of the markets. They have released in 2011 a cybersecurity guidance, which first put public companies on notice that they need to consider security risks in their public uh, filings, so their periodic filings, their 10Ks, et cetera. And they issued another statement just last year, I believe, reminding companies about the importance of considering security risks. And there has been enforcement by the SEC against broker-dealers in connection with regulation of SP, for example. Um, and I would expect to see more enforcement uh, by the SEC in uh, years to come with respect to the disclosure of securities conditions of publicly traded companies to investors, particularly when a breach happens subsequently and hard questions start getting asked about whether mistakes were made. Next, the Department of Defense. So the Department of Defense is charged with providing the military forces needed to deter war and ensure national security. Many of you uh, undoubtedly are familiar with the bug bounty programs that DOD has run in the last few years. 
um, that pioneered the use of bug bounty programs in the federal government, um, and so they have been a leader in terms of uh, helping to nudge security process throughout the government uh, and the uh, joint military institutes such as West Point has a division of their academics devoted to studying security um, and my co-author works there for example. Next, the Department of Commerce. So the Department of Commerce has a mission of uh, improving the conditions for economic growth and opportunity. Many of you are undoubtedly familiar with NIST. So NIST has been deeply involved with setting standards and uh, pushing uh, multi-stakeholder discussions forward and creating security models to try to uh, nudge the level of security uh, forward in the economy. Next, the Department of Transportation and the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. Uh, so here we're talking about cars and other forms of transportation. So uh, the point of uh, this agency's mission is to help to increase the competitiveness of workers and businesses, as they say, in the transportation industry. But uh, certainly uh, it would be NH. TSA's position that they are deeply concerned with safety and since cars are now basically IOT devices on wheels, uh, they have been collaborating with DHS and other agencies and hopefully will continue to engage with the security research community uh, in making all of the automotive offerings in our country safer. Um, an agency you might not have thought about in terms of security is the Consumer Product, the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So the financial products that are regulated by CFPB under the Graham Leach Bailey Act and the Fair Credit Reporting Act grant the agency uh, oversight authority. And so their oversight over these kinds of financial services is. Um, an ongoing supervisory authority, and so their authority is a little different than uh, the way that the FTC engages with entities, for example. Um, the CFPB has a, a team of uh, some very sharp uh, attorneys who work on these issues, and uh, I would expect to see, and I hope to see, uh, further engagement in, in the future, so uh, watch that space. The agency that does not think of itself as a security agency, but I think they've done perhaps one of the most important security related cases of the last few years is the EPA. So uh, many of you have heard or followed the Volkswagen defeat device problems where uh, engineers created a code based device to trick EPA regulators about the air quality that was being emitted by cars. And so in recognizing that those defeat devices were a violation of law and uh, imposing aggressive fines and uh, some people even went to prison in, in Germany over this, uh, what we're seeing is that the questions of code being injected into everyday products are impacting even the EPA and integrity of code matters, not just the confidentiality issues that we might traditionally have thought of in terms of data breach stuff, but um, code integrity is at the heart of uh, what many of these agencies will eventually uh, or currently engage with in, in addressing. And so that brings us to the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Um, and the Consumer Product Safety Commission uh, states that its mission is to protect the public against unreasonable risks of injury or death from consumer products through education, safety standards, activities, regulation, and enforcement. You're humble. You're a small agency. <laughs> with a large mission and work to ensure the safety of consumers every day. And with that, and one minute under time, I turn it over to Commissioner Kay. Thanks, Andrea. And I should say there are, there are other agencies that also have security initiatives going on, but in the interest of time, I stopped myself at 12. Thanks, Andrea, and welcome. Thank you for having us. I'm going to move pretty quickly through the agency because we do really want to get to your questions. And as Andrea mentioned, we would like to have a dialogue. But I like to start when I talk about the agency with a reality check. 
usually more for me than for the audience, but how many people by a show of hands before Andrea started actually have heard of the CPSC? Six, seven maybe, that's not bad. How many people by a show of hands actually own a consumer product? If somebody's not raising their hand, by the way, that would be weird. So the point of that, though, is to show you that even if you haven't heard of us, we actually play a very large role, despite our size, in your daily lives. And if you remember, for instance, I think two of the higher profile cases we've had in the past few years were the Samsung phones that were blowing up and hoverboards that were blowing up, similar issues. But even if it were not at that level, if you've got a crib, if you've got a toaster, if you've got a lawnmower, if you've got an ATV, window blinds, dressers, most of the stuff that you interact with, things you're holding in your hand now, the seats you're sitting on, are actually in our jurisdiction. We were founded in the early 70s, and the point was that it did not seem like through private litigation that when consumers were getting harmed by products, that there was sufficient remedies. And so the agency was created. We're not part of any other department. We're not part of the Department of Commerce or the Department of Defense. We are an independent agency of about 550 employees. And that will become relevant later when I talk about our limitations. Our bread and butter is you plug your toaster in. It shocks you. That's a bad thing. We find out about it. We get an exemplar. What's that? <laughs> we get a, um, we find out about it, we recall it, and hopefully the problem is solved. That has worked for the agency, or did work for the agency, for decades, but it really doesn't work anymore. That's just, yes, we still need to do that, and that's important, but that's not why I'm here today, and that's not really where our focus needs to be going forward. The issues that we're here to talk about today are becoming much more prominent and unfortunately, we're just not great, we, the federal government, but also the agency, at being ready for them. So what we normally do, and I think IoT is slightly different, is we either regulate something through a standard, so cribs, you have to follow a federal standard, has to be made a certain way to be sold in the United States, or if there's not a standard on it, a federal standard, we pursue something on a defect theory. So there is no federal phone standard when the battery blows up, but we were able to show that those phones are defective, and that is what gave us the authority to take action against Samsung. As I mentioned, we have about 550 employees. We are actually nationwide, but most of our employees are here in the DC area. We have a headquarters, and importantly, we also actually have a testing laboratory where we can test anything from the cribs to football helmets to uh, pretty much you name it. We've got electrical engineers, we've got chemists, we've got what you would expect to see in a testing lab with products as diverse as ours are. But ultimately, what we don't really have, and this gets into IoT, we do not have a deep bench of individuals with the expertise to really look at this issue. And that's why we're here today. And so one thing that I've tried to do in my role, and we're going to be introducing it when the shutdown ends, if it ends, is a framework that we're going to be putting out to try to encourage manufacturers and retailers to be thinking about these issues much more than they are right now. And I can tell you they're not really thinking about them. They're certainly thinking about them from a marketing perspective, and it's great that they want to have a refrigerator that you can, that will tell you when you're out of milk, but they're not thinking about it the way they should from a safety perspective. They're not thinking about the vulnerabilities, and they're not thinking about how both that individual refrigerator could be dangerous, but also if it, were end, if it gets combined with other vulnerable products, what that could mean. So we're putting out a framework. It's a guidance for manufacturers. I think what's important about it is we're not going to assume that we've gotten it right. It's entirely possible that when you look at it or somebody you know is look at it, they laugh out loud and say, what a bunch of clowns. That's OK. We're, we're, we're good with that. I think the important thing is we want to have a dialogue. And if you know enough to tell us how off and off the mark we are, that's a good thing. Because that means somebody knows something that we should know. And we're hoping once we put this framework out that people will read it and they will contact us and they'll say, here's what you're missing. This part you may have gotten right, but this is a critical gap in what you're trying to do. And because what we really want to do is create a much larger discussion, not only at the federal level with all of those agencies that Andrea mentioned, but we really need a societal discussion about the vulnerabilities that exist, 
and what are our comfort levels with that and what steps are being taken so that we don't have to be at risk. So ultimately it will involve three parties. It's the manufacturers that we're going to be providing the guidance to. It's folks like you that are going to be hopefully looking at the guidance and looking at products out there. And we, the point of the stickers are that we want people to find vulnerabilities if they exist with various products. And the third part of that is us, the federal government. We want you to report that to us through saferproducts.gov. Again, we're shut down right now, and so I wouldn't expect immediate results. But even when we're back up, it's a somewhat opaque process in part to protect the information of people who are posting or providing us with the reports, and in part because we just, like I said, we don't have great experience. So it might take some time. You might, your hair might be on fire, and I can get away with saying that, but your hair might be on fire saying this product is tremendously vulnerable and it's going to present a safety issue, and it just might take us a little bit of time to bring in the expertise to verify that. But I promise you that it's time well spent. The government needs this kick in the pants to get moving on these issues. So that's pretty much it from the CPSC perspective. We do want to open it up. We're very eager to hear what you think, both about that framework and any other safety issues. OK. Do you want to take questions now or at the end? Uh, I'm, I'm ready whenever you are, but go ahead. We can. We can yeah, let's go ahead. Is Use the microphone. Yeah. It's right here, right? We'll take like one or two questions because we still have a few slides that involve a cow. You know, Sorry, so. <clears throat> no I was eager. Um, is privacy and um, disclosure of information safety? So it's a great question. The question is ultimately about what is the intersection between privacy, information security, and safety? The Federal Trade Commission is your go-to agency when it comes to privacy and information security. So if your sole concern with the vulnerability is that, let's just say there's a, a, an IoT-enabled mattress, and that's capturing somebody's sleep rhythms, it's capturing, capturing some PPI, some important data, and you're concerned that there are vulnerabilities there for that information. That is definitely an FTC issue, because I have a hard time imagining how somebody can turn that vulnerability into a safety issue. I, can't, I mean, it's not like they're going to get the mattress to collapse or that they're going to get the mattress to release its, hopefully it doesn't have them, but it's flame retardant chemicals. It could become a safety issue, though, if that's combined with other vulnerable products that create a network that ultimately does damage. And I think you're getting closer to our jurisdiction at that point. The key aspect to it, though, from my perspective is the vulnerability is probably the same. So even if it's an oven that presents, um, obviously, a more, a more transparent hazard of somebody turning on remotely than a mattress, it might lead to both safety issues and information security issues at the same time. The same vulnerability that FTC would care about for one reason, we would care about for a different reason, but that core vulnerability has to be addressed. I think it might also be good to go over the types of harm that your agency is primarily concerned with. Uh, besides just physical safety, do you uh, concern yourselves with financial safety, uh, emotional wellness, uh, and other types? Yeah, so great question. So the question is the type of harms that we're, we are statutorily charged with getting at. And it really does have to do with physical harms. I think that those are very important harms, things that society, a well-functioning, mature society should be concerned about those harms. But most of those are usually handled through the private litigation system and the court system than they would be through us. For us, if you can't show the likelihood of an unreasonable risk of a physical harm of some sort, whether it's through an electrical issue, a thermal issue, um, some type of mechanical issue, even chemical issues that could be chronic, we're limited by that. But I think, it, again, it's a good point, and it's a good, it's something good for, that's really a congressional issue, too, for Congress to think about as it considers the jurisdictions of these agencies and the funding, what types of harms should we be concerned about? Okay. Let's finish up just the, the rest of our deck, and we will have time for lots of questions, which is the point of this whole enterprise. So how can you help? Well, here is the saferproducts.gov website. This is the form on the saferproducts.gov website. There are a series of questions that if you answer with respect to an IoT product that you have discovered to have a serious vulnerability that, for example, might result in overheating 
or perhaps you have a, an IoT saw that you can manage to uh, make not turn off at will through the internet. That would be the sort of hazard that would be great to report through this site. Um, and if you are, you have to happen to have a down weekend and you're thinking, gee, I'd like to see how vulnerable a particular IoT product is. One way that you can choose a product to research would be to go to the saferproducts.gov website and see what kinds of recalls CPSC has engaged in in the last few years. So these are the products that are potentially particularly of interest uh, to CPSC. Um, and that would be a good place to start. But if you look at the IoT products on Amazon and you think to yourself, wow, it would be really physically dangerous if this product, for example, cut an arm off. That's a really good IoT product to research because uh, even though it won't be challenging for you necessarily to uh, compromise it based on how prevalent, unfortunately, vulnerabilities are in some IoT products, the fact that you can document it thoroughly and share your knowledge with CPSC, if we all collaborate on this and each of you does just one product that would be a truly beneficial and game-changing kind of research. Here's a product that was recently recalled that I find particularly concerning. Uh, so here's a cordless chainsaw that didn't turn off when it should have. Now in this case it likely had nothing to do with the, the code in the chainsaw. But you can see where a different chainsaw might have a code-based integrity problem that uh, lets a remote attacker manipulate the way that a consumer interacts with the chainsaw through, for example, an app that the chainsaw talks to. Um, and another way that you can helpfully share your knowledge if you have a spark of uh, videographic creativity in you. CPSC makes really fantastic safety videos. I don't know if you've experienced these. And they also have a, uh, what I consider to be the best Twitter feed in the whole federal government. Um, so let me, assuming that this works, uh, let me show you one of these safety videos. And this is something that you too could, for example, do and make a safety video about your IoT research experience. Uh, please don't harm any actual children. Oops. Oh no. Let me stop it. Okay, let's see if I can switch. Well, uh, you can tell from the, the sound effects, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to make this work. In the interest of time, I'll try to get this to work during Q&A, and if I can get it up and working, uh, we will. Um, but if not, just take my word for the, f the fantastic uh, safety videos. Um, oh, um, PowerPoint seems to have grabbed my slides. Okay, I will try to make that work during, during Q&A, um, but uh, in a long tradition of informative and engaging CPSC safety videos, you too could make a safety video, for example. And with that, I will Bless remind you. you all that there are in fact stickers with the URL where you can report uh, any issues that you find in IoT products to CPSC and uh, these slides and other helpful information I will post at uh, safer.org, that's a three, not an E, and also the CPSC website is a great resource and the reporting URL again is saferproducts.gov and we are open for questions. We have questions. Uh, so what about uh, middleware devices where the device itself isn't necessarily unsafe, but it could be used in unsafe ways or could be exploited for uh, unsafe ends? I'm thinking specifically of things like uh, network controlled power outlets, for example. So the question has to do with uh, devices that themselves uh, you might not think about presenting the vulnerability or at least it might be sort of a chain in there. When, with any consumer products that are within our jurisdiction, the manufacturer has an obligation under law 
to reasonably foresee what could go wrong with that sort of unintended consequences. So my perspective would be that if the manufacturer of that could anticipate that what you're talking about could occur, then we could have jurisdiction over that if it ended up being part of a chain of products that led to harm. Uh, so we've seen uh, places like New York State introduce legislation where they require financial institutions to regulate like cybersecurity practices. Do you think that you could see something with like Internet of Things or just like just broadly applied where we have instead of just state-based legislation, nationwide legislation to force companies to comply with you know, cybersecurity standards rather than just going with the defect theory like you suggested earlier? So the question is about whether instead of a state-by-state -state approach, we might see a national approach to some type of standards that would have to be complied with for manufacturers. I think that what we need in the interim, at least it need, we need a national voluntary standard or a national set of standards that companies buy into that's achievable, it's realistic to expect small companies, medium and of course large companies to do it. I know that there are parties out there, whether it's NIST, part of the federal government, UL, one of the testing laboratories or others that have worked and are working on this. But I do think that the next step needs to be at least some type of national guideline that everybody agrees is legitimate. My sense, usually when the federal government or there's a national presence, the states stand down. But in the absence, what you're talking about, what you see happening is when there isn't a national presence, the states do step up. I also think that you probably will have to see something that's enforceable at a federal level, so not just a voluntary standard, but it probably will require down the road some type of mandatory provision that we can enforce it or some agency can enforce it, and really mostly to deal with what's coming in at the ports and other places. In the absence of having that enforcement authority, it makes it very difficult for us to address problems at the outset. We usually have to wait, which I think is a terrible policy idea, by the way. We have to wait until people are actually hurt before we can do something about it. And I think if we have the ability to act sooner, I think everybody's better off. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the question. Do you guys have jurisdiction over implantable medical devices like pacemakers? The question is whether we have jurisdiction over pacemakers. So that's actually under the FDA because it's a health device, a medical device. Cool. Thank you. Sure. But what's relevant about that, by the way, is I do think the agencies need to be coordinating. So because whatever issue is going to present itself in a, in a, in a pacemaker, for instance, is likely to present itself in a consumer product in our jurisdiction. And it wouldn't really make sense for the FDA to sort of corner the market on expertise on how to deal with that just in their area. I think the government needs to have that information shared broadly at agencies so we can all deal with it wherever it presents itself. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. So a lot of the IoT crap, basically, uh, that's out there, uh, made overseas, you know, is, is uh, sometimes like a white box situation of we have this thing uh, where you can just slap your name on the outside of the box and reskin the app and, and away you go. Uh, there's uh, seems to be a jurisdictional issue then uh, with being able to say whether or not a uh, manufacturer needs to adhere to these standards if they're not, you know, in this country. Um, is there like any way to uh, enforce something at you know at the ports or border to uh, what can be brought in in terms of things like you know security and, and uh, not just safety? So the question is basically what can we do to deal with uh, imports and get them early? And do we have any? Or can we get to those um, entity or those things that are made overseas that may be pretty substandard and dangerous? Uh, yes, to some extent, and this went to what I said earlier about having an enforceable standard. If we have something that we can enforce at the ports, we do. And it has, but it has to be something that's readily observable. That's part of the statutory requirement. So it can't be that you have to take it apart and, uh, and assemble it and test it to then know whether or not it, if it follows the law. You have to be able to basically look at it and maybe fiddle with it a little bit and be able to identify. And a perfect example is hair dryers that have the GFCI. So if you drop it in a bathtub, it shuts off automatically. It's got a circuit breaker. You can tell when you look at one of those hair dryers when you pop open a shipment at the ports whether they have their GFCIs are on them or not. So it has to have some readily observable characteristic. 
But how would what, that apply to something like a, a mobile app that is associated I think, with a device? I think it would be very difficult at that point, and that's where some of the creativity comes in, in how it's designed, how it's labeled. Maybe there has to be a label on it. It's not foolproof because obviously there's fraud and counterfeits and labeling, but any little step that can be done to at least signal that there is compliance here. I think what has made our jurisdiction or our enforcement efforts probably the most challenged of late is just direct to consumer shipping. So we're not even seeing it because it's coming in in small batches. It's going right to your house, passing by us through some common carrier like FedEx. There's nothing wrong with that. That's totally legal. We just have no ability to know what's in there. And so it's impossible for us to be able to address that. And that, if you combine those two issues, just general direct to shipping, to consumer shipping, and then having something like this, that, that keeps us up at night. I will concede that. And that's why security research is so important and reporting products that are already in the U.S. that reflect the kinds of problems that you're identifying. Uh, we definitely are going to need to talk later because uh, my research uh there's a lot of that sort of situation. So. Absolutely. Uh, but the other uh, related to that is there's entire markets of, of products and uh, uh, vendors that don't realize that they're now a software company, whether they want to be or not, um, don't realize that they have a responsibility for security and, and such like that. They don't know what questions to ask. Um, because they don't go to conferences like this. They don't think of themselves as a network device, you know, with an IP, you're uh, 100 milliseconds away from every jackass on the planet. Uh, how, you know, what, what sort of efforts is there to make some of these companies maybe wake up and realize that, hey, we need to uh, realize what we are now and, yep. and take the responsibility and take actions? Yeah, it's a fantastic question, and the question is basically, what do you do about those companies that historically have really had nothing to do with uh, this type of product? They make a very uh, basic product that has never had software in it, it's never had to deal with coding before. Suddenly they're interested in being having a smart enabled device, and they sort of stumble into this without realizing their obligations. Just that, for reference, yeah. uh, I hack sex toys. Internet connected sex toys. Yeah. So very much that situation of previously a manually operated device. Yep. They now have internet connectivity. They've never had to deal with these problems before. Yep. And they just blissful ignorance and. Yeah. and Do you wear your necklace? Uh, no, I, don't know. <laughs> uh, but I, I do have it with me. The ignorance is the key, though, and. Yeah. I think that there's far more ignorance than there is malintent by those industries. Oh, yeah. I, I don't think that they're turning a blind eye. I think a lot of them just, to your point, don't know what to do. And that's really the key part of why we're putting this framework out. Because part of what we talk about there is the, those obligations, understanding the staffing needs that you have to have, understanding from design perspectives what you need to be thinking about, understanding that culture of receptivity so that if you report to these companies that you're finding a vulnerability, they have the right attitude, that they're going to immediately jump on it. And this is a whole culture change for many different manufacturers. And so we're trying to do our part. And that's a big part of what this guidance is. In a small subset of that, I've actually been doing a lot of that. So uh, definitely have to have some notes to share. So that we'll I talk after. Yeah, definitely. I do think, by the way, that it's going to be a rude awakening for a lot of companies when they see another company when the hammer comes down on them for something that they've done. There's nothing that quite incentivizes behavior than watching somebody else get burned very badly. Already happened. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Which is why, again, reports from all of you can really play a key role. Um, industries, and this is me talking, uh, uh, industries also frequently don't know their own history of vulnerability. Uh, so for example, CPSC had testimony on IoT security and there was a representative from the toy companies who spoke. And uh, that person was not familiar, for example, with some of the challenges that uh, have existed with, with IoT dolls. Um, and so uh, the history just isn't necessarily translating and becoming widely known even within industries that have shared issues. So part of this is the education gap, not only in terms of the technical side, but also in knowing the kinds of problems that other members of their own industries are, are facing. Uh, so I appear to have successfully dragged the video over here. So uh, let me just share this work of uh, public service announcement genius that CPSC created. Oops.
Get on top of it before they do. Every 24 minutes, tipped furniture or a falling TV sends an injured child to the emergency room. Preventing tip-over incidents is easy, inexpensive, and only takes five minutes. Learn how to secure your furniture and TVs to protect children at anchorit.gov. Okay, so imagine a series of IoT safety videos. Maybe some of you would be inclined to make some of them. This would be a great communication mechanism for illustrating some of the problems that you've discovered in the devices that you might uh, research on. So uh, if there are no more questions, we will end. I want to see that through your sex and stuff, okay? I'm pretty glad. Oh, we do have a question, okay. I do have one more question. Um, are you looking for uh, reports of incidences of things that could indicate that there's a vulnerability, or are we looking for research vulnerabilities or something else or all of the above? So the question basically is what are we looking for? Uh, yes. We are looking primarily for, as Andrea mentioned earlier, that if you can spot a vulnerability in a product that's already on the market, we should know about that. And because it's likely that the manufacturer does not know about it, and the potential for harm in our minds uh, is pretty high. It might not be immediate, but it's a vulnerability that's out there that could be exploited, and we don't need those out there. Should we assume that if, we, if the fire department was involved, they would tell you? So the question is, should you assume if one other part of another agency is involved that they would tell us? No, definitely not. It, I mean, we would hope that that would be the case, but I think that you can name all the agencies that Andrea mentioned earlier they might know about stuff and we don't. And we might know about stuff and they don't. It's not because anyone's trying to hide stuff. It's just these are the silos that exist in society. The other point I want to make, by the way, and this goes to the larger capability of CPSC in that video, obviously that tip over, which is a very real thing that's going on still in the United States, that's a mechanical hazard. And it's something you would think that we should have solved by now. We, society, should have solved by now. But the hardest meetings that I have are the parents who come in to see me having lost their kids to whether it's tip overs, window blind cords, what have you. And the reason I'm mentioning this is to give you a sense of how far behind we are, we're still struggling with those types of physical hazards. That is very simple relative to IoT and to these types of hazards that we really do need your help on. We will not be able on our own to identify and address these concerns without your help. It's just critical, and like Andrea said, even if you just take on one thing, one product, it's just critical if you can take some time to use your expertise and your skill to identify these things for us so we can just move that much more quickly to protect society. And please be sure to have a controlled research environment so nothing burns down. And don't have any small children participate. <laughs> Maybe a doll. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, so with that, please come get some stickers and thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much. Thank you.